Good afternoon, my name is Sandy Vale. I'm the Adult Behavioral Health Medical Director for Superior Health Plan, and it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. This is Dr. Omar Manajwala. Dr. Manajwala is regarded as one of the main nation's leading experts on addictions, cravings, and behavior. He has appeared on several national media outlets, including Good Morning America and 2020. And he is the author of Craving, Why We Can't Seem to Get Enough, which explains why we crave and prescribes a practical approach to taming cravings of all sorts. After receiving his medical degree from the University of Maryland School of Medicine, he completed his residency in psychiatry at Duke, where he served as the executive chief resident. He obtained his MBA from the University of Virginia's Darden School of Business. Today, he currently serves as the Senior Vice President and Chief Medical Officer for Catasys, a health services management company that focuses on improving health outcomes while reducing claims costs for health plan members with untreated behavioral health conditions that drive high medical expense. Please join us in welcoming Dr. Manishwala. Thank you, Dr. Vale. Can everybody hear me okay? Great. So um, it's it's really an amazing lineup you guys have put together. I, I give a lot of these talks throughout the year, and I see a lot of uh, places where they pull people together to try to cover a topic in some depth like you're doing here, especially a controversial topic like this one. Um, but what's really interesting about it is that you've pulled together a degree, myself excluded, you've pulled together a degree of pretty serious talent to try to tackle these, these issues, and it's impressive to be able to observe what you're doing and, and kind of to dive in further. My challenge today, my task in the next 45 minutes or so, is to walk you through what I think many of you already know, but just a slightly deeper dive of what's the deal with the intersection between behavioral illness and the experience of chronic pain. What are the drivers of chronic pain from a behavioral perspective? What does chronic pain do to mental illness and behavioral conditions, so bi-directional relationship? Uh, how does that inform treatment? What do we know about the epidemiology of these things? Um, what do we know about the shared neurobiology of chronic pain and addiction? And also, you know, the shared social determinants of health between chronic pain and uh, behavioral health conditions. So I'm gonna try to, and it's a little bit of a Herculean task, but I'll try to do in you know, about 45 minutes, kind of walk you through the basics here, but also leave enough time, hopefully, to you know, tackle into some questions. I don't call it questions and answers, because I don't necessarily propose to have answers for anything that you might ask, but you know, hopefully we can ask the questions together, and if we ask the right questions, I think we'll get to where we need to get to. So let's, so it's really a privilege to do this. So let's dive right in. Um, I'm a believer in just telling you up front what it is you're going to derive from this so that uh, for those who, you know, um, uh, decide they've had enough of me, they can just stand up and walk out or, you know, if you throw tomatoes halfway through, you've already got the gist of what it is. So I'll, I'll walk you through, you know, eight or nine key points that you should take away from this evidence-based, really solid, informed points. And, and I'm told that you guys have access to all the slides, so you'll be able to, you know, I've, each of the slides has, you know, references on it. You can, uh, if you want to get wonkish, you can go down in the weeds with those as well. So uh, the first key point I want to make is that chronic pain and behavioral health conditions clearly have a bi-directional relationship. There's a lot of evidence behind the idea that people with chronic pain experience behavioral health conditions worse and more, more conditions in terms of the N, the number, as well as the severity of conditions, and there's a greater degree of functional impairment there in that overlap. And similarly, when you look at populations that have behavioral health conditions, the uh, the, the, uh, the prevalence, sort of the past year prevalence of uh, chronic pain in that cohort is higher than in the general population. So there's a, there's a kind of a multiplex relationship there, but it is, it's clearly bi-directional. So the second point I want to make is that that, um, that, that relationship between chronic pain and behavioral illness uh, is driven by uh, neurobiology. And we have, a couple, we have several reasons for believing that. Uh, but there's, you know, there's this, there's this sense in medicine that if you show somebody a functional image, they're more likely to believe you. 
Um, and so there's a, there's, a, there's a broad undercurrent of research around uh, functional imaging and uh, explaining the relationship between chronic pain and behavioral comorbidities. So there's a heavy overlap, and the, and the largest overlap exists with depression, anxiety, and substance use disorders. This is where it is. And so where the, where the controversy exists, and really this is um, an event like this can, in a way, unpack that is what is the relationship between addiction and chronic pain um, and you know can we really afford to address addiction and the risk of addiction and leave people with chronic pain in the wake no and can we can we afford to do the opposite no we can't so we're going to have to sort out this mess together um, there are other significant drivers of chronic pain, behaviorally, smoking, suicide, and then uh, I'm, I know you've heard about ACEs here today already, but in particular, sexual violence. So historical and ongoing sexual violence is a serious driver of uh, the um, uh, mitigating the translation of acute pain to chronic pain and exacerbating chronic pain uh, levels, but also the functional impairment that's seen with chronic pain. Um, then I want to walk you through a, a little bit towards the end of the talk this fear avoidance model. Because if you understand that this fear avoidance model, then you get a sense of, well, how would behavioral treatment actually work for chronic pain? How, how, could, how could psychotherapy, how could talk therapy actually ex alter the experience of pain itself? And the fear avoidance model is, I think, one of the better ways to unpack and understand that. Understand uh, um, the, the treatment approaches that are used. Um, I think many people struggle with this notion, especially outside this room. I think people in general struggle with the idea of, well, if we have a problem with opioids, what are we going to do? Because we've got this chronic pain problem, how will we address it? And so another key point I want to drive home for you today is that there are highly effective non-intoxicant-based strategies, I know you've been hearing about them, uh, for the management of chronic pain. And one of the biggest challenges that we face is, how do you get people to engage in that? You know, you heard your last speaker talk about engagement. How do you get people to engage in those kinds of uh, approaches some, sometimes it can be very hard to believe that. The this, this statement that, you know, talk therapy, psychotherapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, acceptance and commitment therapies could actually be effective for pain is hard to believe, just naturally speaking, because pain seems so physical, and so it's, it's sort of a stretch, and so how do we connect those things? But, but, they are, but they are effective, and I'll walk through that. And I think that sort of the final key point I want to make here is that folks who have, just like with addiction or any other chronic disease, folks who are suffering with chronic pain uh, deserve social compassion and the very best evidence-based care. And whatever strategies we use to address the opioid crisis, the opioid epidemic, or what really is an addiction epidemic, um, since alcohol kills, you know, three times as many people as opioids, it's just not killing the right people, that, uh, you know, we have a focus on uh, uh, appropriate social compassionate uh, approaches and evidence-based processes for this group. And yes, that was, that was a little bit uh, sarcastic, but those of us who are in the trenches who observe more recent attention to opioid dependence, uh, despite the fact that opioids have been killing people, especially people in minority communities, for much longer. And, and so that's, a, that's a, a very laden kind of topic, but it is accurate that that is the driver of some of the media attention here. Um, and so let's talk now about context and epidemiology. So, Raise your hand if you already knew this, and just be honest, that over half the opioids prescribed in the US are going to adults with mental health disorders. All right, so a good number of you knew that, over half. So when you look at the solutions that are proposed for the opioid crisis, almost none of them really address this key issue, which is that these medications are going to people who are suffering in a number of other ways. And are those ways really being addressed? Because as we'll show you, the, the majority of people who are suffering with behavioral health conditions are not receiving care and under current paradigms will not receive care. For the, they won't. So they haven't and they won't. And so any, any effort to sort of unilaterally either restrict access or just 
pr uh, you know, predominantly uh, take a uh, turn off the spigot kind of approach to this is uh, going to create a number of larger problems. Uh, and we've, we've seen what happens when you don't think through the implications like pain with the fifth vital sign, et cetera. And we run the risk of actually repeating that experiment now because of our, I think, as a society, our naive views about what it's going to take to to tackle the nexus of behavioral health and, and uh, opioid dependence. So um, just some basic facts here. One in five adults experiences a mental illness. One in 25 lives with serious persistent mental illness. These are things like schizophrenia, et cetera. And about half of all chronic mental illness begins by the age of 14 uh, and three quarters by the age of 24. So these are very developmental. These are very much diseases that may not have, um, certainly don't have the onset of treatment in adolescence and young adulthood, but the, the onset of the illness itself occurs early. And the time to diagnosis and time to treatment can be very delayed. Um, and looking at that another way, uh, focusing on the right two dials here, about almost 7% of adults live with depression, uh, and about 18% of adults are living with anxiety disorders. Um, by the way, many people don't realize that anxiety is much more prevalent. Uh, there was a, a Amazon recently released uh, some, some data on Alexa, and they said the single most common request from Alexa was, Alexa, help me relax. That's an astonishing fact, that you've got this device, you can order all sorts of things in the world, but the single most important thing that you want to get out of this device is some assistance with uh, your anxiety. Uh, there's a huge overlap between depression, uh, between uh, mental uh, health conditions and uh, addiction. There's a large population of people who are suffering with both. The, as I mentioned, the majority of people who have behavioral health conditions are not receiving services for them. So uh, they are untreated. We describe them as the silent sufferers. These are people who uh, may be avoiding care for a number of reasons. They may not believe that they have a condition. They may not be able to get access to treatment. Uh, they may, um, uh, they, the condition themselves can make it hard to get out of bed and, and you know, navigate all the steps that's necessary to get care. Um, there can be fear of what the care looks like. There can be stigma. People may not believe that treatments work. There's all sorts of reasons why people don't get care. And in thinking about chronic pain in a similar venue, chronic pain is also very common. So what do we know about, and forgive me if you've already covered this today, but I think by way of review it would be useful. So. Um, you know, this is one of the better studies that looked at um, the prevalence of chronic pain. It's a little hard to read, so I'll break it down for you a little further. Um, but fundamentally, they've got about 126 million adults that have experienced some pain in the last three months. So that's about a little more than half the Americans have, have experienced that. Um, and you got about 11% of adults in the United States that are suffering from chronic daily pain. So that's, you know, that's a pretty substantial number of people who are, str who are struggling with this. And you know, when you think about all the implications of that, the morbidity of that, the cost of that, the intersection with mental illness and with medical illness, um, and the barrier to engagement that that creates, it's a fairly substantial problem. And it's the reason I think we're all here today. Um, and you got about 10% who report, quote unquote, a lot of pain. So this is some effort to try to um, characterize the severity of pain. All the references are down in the left corner, so when you download the slides, feel free to uh, get nerdish. Um, this is a, a very hard to read slide, but it's intended to show you that the largest epidemiologic studies that try to answer this question of how common is behavioral, how common are behavioral health conditions in people who have chronic pain, you know, the bottom line takeaway is probably you've got five or six percent of people who have chronic pain who don't have a co-occurring mental condition. Five or six percent who don't. So it's very, very common to have another, uh, to have a behavioral health condition if you have chronic pain. And this is more, unfortunately, it's a little tough to read, so I apologize for that, but this is basically um, that the pan across the top are the panel of studies out there that have tried to answer this question of what the overlap looks at. So you can take my word for it that the overlap is so exceedingly high that it's unusual to not have behavioral health conditions with chronic pain, or if you want to dig deeper, go in and check it out for yourself. But my um, research through this suggests that this is correct and that the, the, uh, the, the prevalence of chronic pain is high. This is a slide that can walk you through um, the, 
the, the, the breakdown prevalences of various types of pain within conditions. So how often do we see spinal pain and people have depression? How often do we see neuropathic pain and people have anxiety? How often do we see fibromyalgia and people have substance use disorders? And this can really, digging into this, if this is your work or the nature of your work can be very valuable. We use it at my firm today, uh, at plus our own analytics to really have a deep understanding of uh, predictive analytics and imputing the presence of conditions when they're not diagnosed, which is, I think, can be very valuable to use predictive analytics and big data uh, analytics to try to find out what's there when you can't see it there. Um, so there's all these behavioral health conditions, so why don't we just go treat them? And the reason is, well, there's many reasons why we can't do that. One was engagement, which you just heard about from our previous speaker. Um, but another reason is that we don't have enough um, psychiatrists to treat these folks. It's, it's, it's entirely impossible from a workforce standpoint that if, even if we were able to engage everybody to have enough behavioral health experts to do that. And you say to yourself, okay, fine, don't use psychiatrists. Use extenders. You know, use behavioral health nurse practitioners or PAs. It doesn't even come close. You're not even close to the workforce that you need to be able to address this. So you have to use approaches like collaborative care and, and other approaches to try to really stratify your populations into who really needs that level of expertise. And then you also have to beef up with ECHO and other approaches that you've heard about. You have to beef up the capabilities of, pri of the primary care environment to be able to deliver care to these folks. And so, you know, if you look at it, psychiatrists represent basically 5% of the physicians in the United States but mental health conditions is 20%. So, you know, just at a very simple level, it's clear that you just can't, it's not going to work. The other reason not to solve it that way is that people like you more than they like us. It's just been shown time and again that people prefer working with their primary care providers. I, I don't know what it is about psychiatrists or what it is about me, but apparently we're just not as likable as you are. Uh, we've learned to live with it. Um, so, you know, we go through our own analysis and, and therapy when we're in residency, so I feel confident about it, but I also, you know, own it and know that people would just much rather be treated by you than they would by me. And so, uh, and so that's yet another reason to do it that way. Um, and by the way, people have figured that out. Patients have figured that out. The, the, vast, the, the majority of people um, who are diagnosed with psychiatric conditions who are getting treatment are being treated by their PCPs. Not by their behavioral health, not by behavioral health experts. So it's happening there anyway, I think you know that. Um, but that's not fair either, because if you try to treat these behavioral health comorbidities in a primary care environment, you don't have the resources to do it. They don't exist. So, you know, PCPs write almost 80% of all the antidepressant prescriptions. Um, you, you see about 60% of all the people that are being treated for depression, just to use depression as an example, you can make similar slide for anxiety and other behavioral health conditions, but they do this with, that, with almost no support from specialty services. Um, uh, we have, as psychiatrists, we've taken on the mantle of being responsible for providing support to primary care, but we have failed in that endeavor. I mean, we're trying, but fundamentally we've failed in being able to do that, although there's a lot of innovation trying to solve for that now. Um, and even if you look at collaborative care, which is super important and critical and came, you know, really, uh, there's, you know, deep literature on that. You've been hearing about that as a way of solving this. But even if you apply sort of the best data that's out there for collaborative care, it doesn't even come close to touching being able to engage the majority or even half of the people who have these conditions. So collaborative care gives you a big boost in your ability to engage and treat, but you're still not even halfway there with collaborative care. So I think one, one critical point that I want to make today is, yes, collaborative care, but what's next? Because we're not even close. Even if we succeed in implementing that, we're not even close to where we need to be. So we have to be thinking about what's next, what's next. Um, even though that itself, collaborative care, is a huge shift in our, in our care delivery. Um, and as I mentioned, it is very difficult to treat uh, depression. Uh, you've got, in primary care environments, anywhere between a quarter and a half of the people will not be identified. Now, we've shifted in a lot of ways towards measurement-based care, screening types of approaches. You've got many folks who are underdosed. Most don't continue medications beyond 90 days. So it's really, really, by the way, that's not unique to depression. You see the same kind of problems with hypertension and other chronic. It's just hard to treat chronic diseases. That's, it's 
It's hard to do that. So um, it doesn't. But depression and substance use disorders, anxiety have an added burden because they have folks who have these conditions have all the same problems that people with other chronic diseases have, but they also have the burden of relationship issues, trust, problems with activation, mood, hope, self-efficacy, all the stuff that goes along with having a, so it's, it's, it's as hard as, and then even harder uh, to treat these conditions. Then, you know, from the primary care lens or from the system of care lens, you've got all these social determinants of health. It's a, it's a hot topic to talk about these. We all want to understand what they are, um, how they influence the care, and most of us feel like we have no ability to impact them. And although we do have some ability to impact the social determinants of health, by and large, the thing that go around the circle are very, very difficult to solve for if it's just one or two stakeholders that's going after the the solution. And similarly, you can look at the determinants of mental health. So I wanna, I wanna move through this a little more quickly here, but uh, this is a slide you can review at your leisure later, but essentially it's intended to show the various levels of the pain matrix and the way that um, emotions, memory, attention, and cognition impact the experience of pain at all levels of the pain matrix neurobiologically. So if you're interested in the sort of the, the neuroscience of how that happens, this is a great slide and these references are, are great to take a look at. But just to use an example here, migraine patients have two to three times, they're two to three times more likely to have anxiety than the general population. And anxiety patients are about twice as likely as the general population to have migraines. And there's a shared neurobiology between those conditions too, because both those conditions, anxiety disorders and migraines, have involvement of the thalamus, prefrontal cortex, uh, anterior cingulate uh, uh, cortex, activated by both conditions there. Um, I'm going to skip over screening for behavioral health conditions because I think everybody here knows we need to do that. But I want to make one point about the screening of behavioral health conditions, which is it almost doesn't matter how you do it. Now, you've got, like, for example, under depression, look at the sensitivity and specificity, anxiety again there. These are, these are really good instruments. You've got a broad panel of really good instruments to screen for these conditions, okay? So you've got to use the one that's familiar to you, and, all, and that's, that's important. But then systems of care should try to stick to an instrument so that they can collect data and understand what's happening at the population level. So I would say if you have a system of care um, where you are using multiple instruments for depression, then you're really shortchanging your ability to compare and un understand that, those data and what impact you're making overall. So pick something, get to know it, and stick with it. Okay, how does acute pain become chronic pain? So one of the key points here is that psychological processes are directly involved in mitigating the transition between experiencing some pain and then developing chronic pain. And that involves your feelings, your thoughts, what you pay attention to, and the things you do. If you shut down, if you, don't, uh, if you freeze, if you aren't active in some way, um, then you're more likely to progress to chronic pain. And one of the big drivers of that is fear. It turns out fear is really, really bad for you. It's bad for your health, it's bad for a lot of things. It's bad to be afraid. Everybody's gonna experience fear, but chronic fear is highly debilitating. And it's very much a driver of the transition from acute to chronic pain. It's very much a driver of the disability that's associated from chronic pain. And that's all mitigated by this thing called catastrophizing or pain catastrophizing. So you have these negative interpretations about anything that's going on, any experience you're having or any pain-related health information from yourself or from without. And then you start to have all these thoughts about that, okay? And then those together are called pain catastrophizing and they lead to fear. And fear is really bad for you, as I said. Fear causes you to focus your attention on pain. That makes you hypervigilant. Then you start to avoid doing the things you need to do in order to get better. And that leads to worsening pain. And that makes you even more scared. Now, I recognize this is oversimplified, but this is accurate. I mean, most of the, most of the treatment approaches that therape psychotherapeutically address pain operate off some version of this cycle, some version of this cycle. Uh, I'm not gonna go through this, but it walks through in a little bit more detail um, the, the levels of, the, the schema behind fear avoidance. So you have pain, negative affect, and pain, uh, well, I just told you I wasn't gonna do it, so I'm not gonna do it. Uh, <laughs> Because I have a limited amount of time and I really want to get down to treatment. So, um, and I want to talk about what we do too. A little bit, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Crow asked, asked me to do that. So, um, 
If you're looking at approaches to chronic pain and the overlap between behavioral health conditions and chronic pain, we look at cognitive behavioral therapy, we look at acceptance and commitment therapy, multidisciplinary pain rehabilitation has an evidence base behind it, psychopharmacology definitely very, very important, and approaching it using the chronic disease uh, model. With the therapies, what we try to do is really target the harmful effects of this fear and this catastrophizing and develop some strategies around that. And it's, very, it's a very homework-driven kind of approach if you don't know what cognitive behavioral therapy is. There's a lot of work involved. So it's not sort of a passive thing where you kind of take it in like Netflix or whatever. You, there's work to do when you're in therapy. And people, you know, people don't like to work. And if you have pain, it's even harder. And if you have behavioral health conditions, it's even harder. So how do, you, how do you get through that? So people come up with all sorts of interesting ideas. Can we pay people to do it? Can we deliver it telehealth? There's this whole challenge around engaging people in doing something that's really hard to do. Uh, at the end of the day, we need to re-engineer how we're, our belief is that we need to re-engineer how we deliver care so that this is actually the path of least resistance. It's, it's harder to live a day with pain than it is to do this. That's what it has to be. And only when we re-engineer the care to make it that way will it be effective. Uh, I think acceptance and commitment therapy is another step in this direction. It's, it's basically the idea that it's the beliefs you have, the kind of inflexibility of the beliefs you have about chronic pain that cause you to not pursue the things that are very valuable in your life. And that failure to pursue things because of those beliefs are what lead to disability. And so it really focuses around the non-judgmental acceptance of pain and getting people to commit to life goals and understand that they can live a life, a very functional and happy life uh, in the context of pain. And when you do that, the interesting thing is the pain also, get, the functional gets better, but the pain also gets better, which is remarkable. And there are several RCTs that evaluate the efficacy of this. Um, and a meta-analysis of 22 RCTs that looked at these types of interventions. And so I don't see what the hedge is, is on this, but I just recall that there's a strong evidence base here. So, uh, and here, here's, here's, some of the, um, uh, here's some of the evidence behind the psychopharmacology of folks who have chronic pain and behavioral health comorbidities too. So very, very important to address both. Um, this slide says, if something doesn't seem right, trust your gut told you so sincerely your intuition. And I think what's really, one of the big things that comes as a challenge when systems of care try to implement processes and changes to affect the health of populations, growing, burgeoning populations that are sick, is that it becomes sort of cookbooked and uh, the art of medicine is lost. And then it's hard, I think that systems of care don't want to hear about the art of medicine because they sort of hear it as not evidence-based care sometimes. And then, the, and then the practitioners, hard to hear the systems because it's sort of like you don't understand that every person is different. Um, and I think that there's, there's truth in both of those. But at the end of the day, any solution that does not allow for the degree of flexibility necessary for clinicians to be able to apply uh, you know, decades of experience is, that's not going to work. That, that approach has got to be astonishingly naive. So we have to respect, I think, the autonomy of clinicians in that, in that context. Um, all right, so that's what I wanted to talk about with respect to chronic pain and behavioral health. I want to briefly walk you through what we do um, at our firm, uh, because I think it's, it's, um, it's interesting and topical and relates to um, what you've been hearing about today. So our, our observation, which has been validated in a number of different ways, is that there's a huge body of people in any population where, they're un where the failure to get treatment for behavioral health is exacerbating their medical comorbidities. So if you think about a typical person who might have this, might be someone who has chronic pain, congestive heart failure, COPD, and depression, and as a result of not getting care for depression, has an incremental additional one or two hospitalizations a year or two or three ER visits, simply because the underlying behavioral health condition is not being treated. That's a very expensive and quantifiable phenomenon, um, and it represents this middle band here. And for us, in uh, most adult populations, uh, the average per member per year cost of, of members like this from a claim standpoint is about $30,000. So to the tune of about $30,000, untreated behavioral health is uh, causing very expensive exacerbations and very, you know, a lot of morbidity associated with these exacerbations of, of medical health. And that's our target. So what we do, uh, and if you look at this group, interestingly enough, uh, um, what you find is that the vast majority of them are not receiving any behavioral health care whatsoever. They're just not getting help. Now, and there's lots of reasons why. We talked about them earlier. 
So what we do is we use an analytic approach. So we, we, we take claims, we run them through a very sophisticated uh, AI-driven, machine-learning-driven learn, predictive analytic engine to try to identify people for whom untreated behavioral health is producing impactable medical exacerbations, chronic medical disease exacerbations, and we develop a targeted list there. We outreach to these folks and engage them in care using proprietary engagement approaches, and then they receive care that's delivered by a network of psychiatrists and other practitioners, psychotherapists. Um, and at the same time, they receive a fairly intense telephonic coaching by nurses who are experienced in this area and face-to-face -face support by local in-market community care coordinators who can help with sort of the face-to-face -face side of things. And the end result of that is that people experience uh, better health, reduced inpatient visits, reduced emergency room visits, and they're receiving adequate care for their uh, behavioral health conditions. So what this en enables us to do is to apply additional resources against people for whom untreated behavioral health these are people who we know and have modeled and shown not only have not gotten behavioral health treatment, but will not get behavioral health treatment. So unless some effort is applied to engage these folks in care, they will not get help. And this will continue to be a driver of illness and a driver of cost. So we're able to solve for this. Um, and the way we do that is we um, uh, engage them in an evidence-based set of treatment protocols that's delivered by a network of providers that we contract with. Um, and the end result is that um, uh, people experience approximately half the costs uh, per member per year that they did uh, in the year preceding enrollment and treatment. There's an 80% retention rate in the program, uh, and uh, there's a, um, a very low opt-out rate. So. Um, our, our firm has uh, uh, contracted with uh, five of the eight largest health plans uh, in America and is growing rapidly in our ability to deliver uh, behavioral health care to this group of people that would, would avoid it anyway. So uh, that's in uh, 40 minutes, uh, Dr. Crow, what I wanted to cover for you today. So thank you. And that leaves us a good 10 minutes for questions. Is that right? Or five? 10? OK. Well, we'll see how many we have. So. Yes, please. Right, okay. So um, the way that the process works is once we identify a member using the analytic approach, w the predictive analytic approach, we outreach to them. And we use a number of approaches to outreach to them. So most case and care management models emphasize a motivational interviewing approach. And we do too, everybody does, I think. We go beyond that by using consumer engagement strategies. So what we've done is we've researched the cohorts of people who are avoiding behavioral health care who have medical comorbidities. And we've done that through focus group testing and a number of other ways to understand why are you not getting care? What would you be willing to do? And why would you be willing to do that? And so by, by, by sort of developing a deeper understanding of the drivers of care avoidance, we can then tailor outreach strategies to engage a group that's avoiding care. Once they agree to, and we don't consider that enrollment, so a lot of case and care management programs will consider talking to a member, getting to know them, collecting data about them, encouraging them to get help as enrollment. We don't consider that enrollment. We consider all that pre-enrollment. Enrollment for us is the member has executed a behavior change and agreed to participate in the program. The program itself is the member getting care from a psychotherapist out of manual driven protocols that we created, that I wrote, um, and, psych and pharmacotherapy from a practitioner. It, most likely a psychiatrist could be an extender. In some cases, it may be an addiction doc with an X number or something else. But pharmacotherapy, whether it's MAT or something else, over the course of a 52-week period. So that's the duration of the program. And what we've shown is that at that point, the majority of people can be transitioned back to primary care-based approaches. 80% of the enrollees 
complete the program, and there is a 50% reduction per member per year cost on a pre-post basis, but we've also validated that with a matched pair, matching along several dimensions. We've also done, uh, one of our large customers has done an attribution of effects approach, um, and we've also survived the actuarial validation of other health plans as well. Does that answer your question? It is a best in class type of enrollment rate. Right. So then you get to who gets Yes, so what we do is we uh, apply the model, we apply our model, which is designed to identify members who are likely to be impacted by our intervention. So rather than applying standard 3M or some other kind of impactable model, we have used, we, our, our model has been self-learning, so we understand which members are likely to respond. So if someone is 55 years old and has COPD and CHF uh, and depression, but they've had a hospitalization pattern of X or Y or certain ER visits or certain pharmacotherapy, uh, that person may not have impactable costs, whereas somebody else may have impactable. So we do, we do select for those members, and there could be a selection bias, but that is, uh, but we've controlled for that in a number of ways by allowing our customers to conduct matched pair studies and, and other approaches to um, correcting for things like enrollment bias and selection bias in a, um, let's say, uh, 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 I'm blanking on the word, but these are, these are approaches that uh, attempt to uh, control for uh, the um, uh, effect of these variables um, in non-experimental, non-randomized kind of ways. Yeah, sir, you had a question? Right. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Exactly. 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 Right. And those things have their roots mostly in the early Right. And including psychotherapists who I'm not paying him, by the way. I just want to be clear about that. Right. 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 That's right. So, first of all, if you didn't catch all of that, your loss, because I agree with everything he just said. Um, what, what I'll say is that if you look at this period, I, I fully agree with you that we have a massive training deficit. And you know that's not to say that we need to build an entire workforce of psychoanalysts, but the inability to conduct dynamically informed uh, therapy is a major gap, in, especially when we've now discovered that adverse childhood experiences are drivers of this. So if you look at this pyramid, uh, higher up is higher PMP per member per year cost, further down is lower PMPY, and as you go down the PMPY, it's more and more important to apply these principles because you have to, you have to affect change in a way where you're not going to be able to offset major um, uh, uh, hospitalizations, and you, you have to find a way for treatment of the lower cost and lower and lower cost cohort to be, to deliver an ROI. And the way to do that is to raise the floor of the quality of all of the treatment that you're providing throughout the entire system. Now, I don't know how to solve for that, except that I agree with you. Our approach in the green band is to not only 
and I don't like to use the word cherry pick, but we, we do, but we built a model for impactability. Um, but we also built a model to identify providers who are likely to adhere to uh, approaches that will deliver effective outcomes. So we, are, we have the luxury of treating a smaller number of members, even though they cover a massive amount of costs, and we have the luxury of being able to contract with a smaller number of providers, which a health plan can't do. We can pay those providers more. We, we can pay them out of our fee more. We can make life really good for those small group of transplant network size group of providers. And what we do is we match that to these green banded patients and we acknowledge that we don't yet know how to solve it for everyone else and just be honest about that. But by the way, at, at my firm, we're in development on digital and other strategies to move down the PMPY, but it's not gonna be easy. There's, by the way, there's, a, there's no shortage of people who claim there's an app for that and there's no app for that. So be clear about that. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Shada, I'm a practicing pain physician. Thank you for an excellent talk. Thank you. Okay, so you and I are co-managing pain patients. Thank you. I actually have a patient on substance over anxiety and mental. I've got a person who pays on opioids. He's got black box warning. What are you guys doing? So, Here's the thing about that, which is that not only do we have a black box warning, but just for everybody else, we have a massive overdose rate in that co-occurring group. So what we should be doing is addressing anxiety using non-intoxicant-based strategies in people who are at risk of problems associated with intoxicant-based approaches. So we should be delivering uh, evidence-based psychotherapy for anxiety disorders. We should be uh, prescribing non-intoxicant-based approaches like SSRIs and others for that. Um, and in combination with evidence-based treatment and addressing all the primary drivers as well. At our firm, we, uh, we contract with a group of providers that are comfortable executing those changes. We acknowledge that the world of psychiatrists and therapists are not necessarily comfortable with that. So we look for those who are and train them additionally further. F folks, I, I just want to be very clear. It ain't fair, right? It ain't fair, but uh, we know that this model has the ability to propagate in both directions. If you start to show effective outcomes by a best-in-class kind of approach, then you can make the case that everyone should be delivering care in this way. But if that member were cycling through my program, they would be, hopefully, would be enrolled in a, um, our manual-driven approach for the treatment of anxiety disorders that's primarily CBT and ACT-based, but some MI and MET. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Let's hear it for Omar. All right. Thank you all. Awesome group. Great questions.